as well. Okay, perfect. All right, so I just, oh my goodness. I want to thank each and every one of you all for joining us today for the By Design Supplier Diversity Symposium. This is a collaborative effort between many organizations that have had many conversations around how do we advance purchasing opportunities in Wichita and the greater region. I'm so pleased with the assembly that we have here today. But um, many of you all who have been in rooms with me, you know, we have to take a moment to set the atmosphere. Again, you all could choose to be anywhere. You're chosen to take time to be with us today. I do ask for, as I mentioned earlier, a little grace. This is our very first hybrid presentation. How many of you all have played around with hybrid? If you're on Zoom, raise your hand. Oh my goodness, then you all are very brave. We're being brave for you <laughs> to make sure that we can get um, a high quality event with people all across our region. And I do want to thank Ken A.V. for being spectacular and helping with our tech needs today. I also want to thank the Wichita State University Office of Strategic Planning and Engagement. Um, let's go ahead and begin with our uh, presentation. Okay. All right. So by design is a statement. It means moving according to plan or by intention. And when we are talking about supplier diversity advancements, it has to be intentional. It absolutely has to be intentional. Right now, Wichita in particular, and think about for those on Zoom, your areas, your cities, there's some capital projects that are happening. And in Wichita, there is a surge of them that is really creating opportunities for us to do business in different ways and to be more inclusive in doing so. We, need to bring them home. we have an opportunity for homecoming to happen and we are so excited about homecoming. Create Campaign is a minority business development nonprofit that does workshops and trainings. We have really plugged into supplier diversity. We have a microloan fund specific to minority business enterprises in Wichita. And we also, with the collaborative partnership with Kansas Business Services, Darius Wright, and several other major organizations, including the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce in Evergy, we've been able to create a contractor collective that looked at providing more professional development for minority contractors to be more competitive. And in doing so, we were able to also allow them to work on exterior home improvement projects at no cost to the homeowners. Why do I mention this? Why do I mention the gentlemen who built their companies outside of here? Why do I mention Prosper? It's because we see what happens when intention occurs in supplier diversity. And so from Prosper, we've been able to see that there's a lot more that can be done, but we are not at all alone in this work. Just since 2020 in the um, initiatives that I am aware of, we have activities from the DBE, WBE steering committee that Jonathan oversees with the Wichita um, public school district. We have the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce doing diversity, equity, and inclusion in committee work and also with staffing resources. We know the SBA has been a long time player in this doing the 8A program and the Emerging Leaders program. We also know that in February, Create Campaign had a really dynamic conversation around what the spend is locally with Black businesses in particular through the Black Business Roundtable. That kicked off a whole nother set and series of conversations. Hi, how are you? We were able to talk with the University's Office of um, um, Planning and Engagement, and they created the Minority Business Consortium that looked at how are we writing our RPs, RQs, RFIs. What does that look like in being intentional to getting yep. more activity and traffic around our purchasing dollars? So, with that being said, the conversations have been going on. This represents an opportunity to bring many of them together. You know, when we talk about being intentional, it really does take a commitment. It takes a commitment to show up. It takes a commitment to listen. It takes a commitment to learn. So today's intention with By Design is we are looking to share actionable supplier diversity strategies from stakeholders in Wichita and the region. We want to mobilize these stakeholders to amplify efforts. And if you all will advance Kent for me, so that they can see our intention today. On your tables, you will see and notice you'll have um, uh, notebooks to be able to take notes with. If you're on Zoom and you wanna chat some of the questions, please make sure to do so. 
we want to make sure that everyone has an ample opportunity to participate and engage. You can advance. Just again, another example of some of the efforts that have happened in the Wichita area that I spoke to. You can advance. So I ask you all today, and if you are in Zoom land, chat this as well, what intention do you have in being here today? What's your intention? Just shout it out. Okay, we hear get people paid. Learn. To learn. Network. Network. Connections. For those of you in this room, if you would please, if you're a purchasing professional, just raise your hand. Wonderful. If you're a business leader, raise your hand. On Zoom, raise your virtual hands for me. If you are a minority business enterprise, a firm, a contractor, please raise your hand. If you're a minority owned business in the room, a create campaigner even, raise your hand. There we go. This is a great opportunity when we are talking about networking and uh, making impact and broadening the conversations, maybe beyond our own organizations and bringing others into the conversation. This is an opportunity to do so. So I welcome you into that intention. All right. So now if you advance, just a quick highlight on today's agenda. We have, again, your facilitators, me. I'm excited to facilitate this. We also have some great subject matter experts who we are going to hear from. Sometimes when you come to conversations like this, you hear from organizations that maybe don't have a comparable experience as us. That's not today. We were able to connect with Maya from uh, the state of Indiana. And what they're doing around supplier diversity is quite commendable. It's a stretch goal, but it's absolutely achievable. And she's going to tell us how they've been able to achieve it. I'm not going to steal her thunder. Then we're going to bring it back to Wichita. We're going to look at what can we do as contractors to be more competitive. And Darius Wright from Kansas Business Services is going to lead that discussion in the breakout room that is to my right, your left. LaShonda Garns from Fidelity Bank, she is going to share with us in this room um, if you're in person, to my left, your right, how you can create a corporate culture that supports inclusion. Because I tell you what, a supplier diversity policy does not matter if it is in a, a culture that does not understand inclusion. So we've got to set that foundation and then build policies, practices, and procedures from there. After our breakout sessions, and those of you all who are on Zoom again, I asked you if you are a purchasing professional, please put a one behind your name so that we can get you to the correct Zoom room. And then if you are a business owner, please put a two behind your name so we can put you in the right room as well. And then from there, we're gonna come back together and hear some best practices before we leave. I understand there's a really great event that's happening right up against our, so we will be mindful of you all's time. And again, I just thank you very much for, for being with us. If you'll advance, you'll hear um, who will round us out in our presentation today. You will hear breaking news from R Rhonda Harris, who is with the Kansas Department of Commerce. This is breaking news. And you will also hear from Kay Monk Morgan about, again, our host and what the university is doing. With that being said, are all minds good? You guys feeling great? Okay. We are going to get ready to go into our keynote presentation. And let me give you just a little glimpse of who you will be hearing from if you'd like to advance. So Maya Siprashvili is the Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Supplier Diversity at the Indiana Department of Administration. In this role, she, together with her team, supports and advocates for the minority business enterprises, women business enterprises, and Indiana veteran-owned small businesses throughout the state of Indiana. She helps MBEs, WBEs, and service veterans acquire certification and empowers the success of all certified businesses through business development and outreach and contract compliance efforts. Most importantly, the DSD team provides equal opportunities to contractors, uh, contractor communities by introducing them to the state procurement and contracting processes and opportunities. I'm going to hand the virtual mic off to Maya. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Christina. Can everybody hear me well? Is my sound check good? Sound check is wonderful. Excellent. I'll be more than happy to talk about Indiana's Division of Supplier Diversity once again. Thank you for a wonderful introduction.
Christina, and thank you for having me here today. One day, I hope I'll get to visit Kansas and be in Wichita in person. I've never been there. Next slide, please. And I thought it was important to talk about the creation and as well as the mission and the vision of our division. And as you can see, it was established in 1983 and we're still talking about it in 2021. And we will talk, we will say why, because, and that's really in our mission and vision. That's because we want to uh, provide the program and have the program that provides fair opportunities and um, equitable opportunities for our minority women and venture-owned businesses. Originally, uh, the division had minority and women's business enterprises. And then as of 2018, we added, hey. in, we added Indiana uh, veteran-owned small businesses. Hey. And then we are called Division of Supply Diversity. So that this program exists here by law. And uh, we will see why it's important to note that. And originally it was Governor's Commission on, on Minority and Women's Business Enterprises. And as of July 1, 2020, uh, remember we added the Indiana Veteran Owned Small Business Program in 2018. The commission is now called Governor's Commission on Supply and Diversity. I also wanted to bring the regulations to you that in, uh, 25 Indiana Administrative Code and uh, Article 5 that also defines all the, re all the processes as to how we operate within the Division of Supply and Diversity. Minority and Women's Business Enterprises, Indiana Veteran Owned Small Business Program was also created by the law. And um, while my gender and race conscious program was created for historically disadvantaged and discriminating groups such as minority and women, Indiana Veteran Owned Small Business was created for the purpose of thank you for your service for Hoosier veterans or Hoosier, uh, are Hoosiers who served in the United States Armed Forces. So two different purposes for program creation. However, very similar processes and regulations. And that's why IVOSB's program is also under uh, Division of Supply Diversity. Next slide, please. And um, I always say that we serve uh, two masters. So over here, I will talk about two capacities. And uh, capacity number one is that we, as the Division of Supply Diversity, are housed under the, uh, at the Department of Administration, under Office of Department of Administration. This is where we get paid from, if you will. And the master number two is the, or the capacity number two that we serve is the Governor's Commission on Supply Diversity, which is basically um, the, the uh, commission that is created by the law and all the appointees are there by the governor. And that's who we are accountable for when it comes to program policies and guidelines and procedures. It is a little bit difficult to serve the two masters, however, not impossible. And uh, it actually creates very good accountability that I will talk about it later, how that played into the advantage uh, to strengthen our program. Next slide, please. So I talked about the law, I talked about the structure, I talked about where we're housed at and what the Governor's Commission on Supply Diversity is. And I wanted to give you the org chart as well, if you were wondering how we, uh, what our structure looks like. And you see a couple of vacancies, just like everyone else probably in the market, COVID caused uh, lots of, um, uh, un unpleasant events, obviously, and we have some vacancies now. Um, they're actually four, and when we are when we are fully staffed, we have eleven people under the um, commissioner, and including myself. And uh, you can see that there are three teams, if you will: uh, the business development, outreach, certification, and contract compliance. Next slide, please. And. Um, and that brings me to the core main or main functions of the Division of Supply Diversity. So I always say, if you don't remember anything about the structure, the law, you know, how we operate, please remember that uh, our main three uh, functions uh, that are, first of all, function number one, certifying minority women and veteran owned businesses. We are the only certifying agency for gender and race and Indiana veteran owned small businesses within the state of Indiana. So we are the only certifying agency. So that's function number one. Function number two is contract compliance. When it comes to contract compliance, 
we become a tier two or subcontractor program. And what that means is Indiana, all the competitive bids and requests for proposals, requests for quotation or information has the part of the bid package for the respondent to have subcontractors who are certified by us. And they're minority, women and veteran. And once the award is made, award is made partly based because during the evaluation of the RFP request for proposal or quotation, Prime pledged certain goals to the minority women and veteran owned subcontractors. And then once the award is made, we make sure that we uh, hold that Prime accountable because they need to make sure that they, uh, they fulfill to their minority women and veteran owned commitments, which trust me, sometimes they conveniently forget about and we are here to remind them. And function number three is business development outreach, kind of what we are doing today. I always tell my team, we can have a great contract uh, certification program, great contract compliance program, but if we are not talking to our vendor community, if we are not doing outreach and uh, giving them educational piece, as well as information about upcoming or current uh, contracting opportunities, then we are not doing a good job. Next slide, please. And I know most of us in the industry know what an MBE and WBE and IVOSB or a, you know, com commonly known as VBE, Veteran Business Enterprise means, but I wanted to, Indiana has a couple of peculiarities and I wanted to um, uh, point that out as well. We look at ownership for a qualifying member, meaning a minority or a woman or a veteran needs to have at least 51% ownership. Sometimes they might have even 100% ownership, but we see that the control is not there. So we look at the control as well. And our program is for US citizens. So like the city of Indianapolis, for example, or federal DVE disadvantaged business enterprise has permanent residents uh, um, as, uh, as well in their category and criteria for the uh, eligibility for the program, however, State of Indiana code does not have that. We, we certify only U.S. citizens. And when we look at the um, minority and women business enterprise, we also look at if they are ready, willing, and able to perform the work in government sector. So in other words, we don't usually certify startups. We certify businesses who have performed and have demonstrated success within the business sector and preferably in the government sector. And that the, uh, we ask those questions and gather that uh, material through the proof of payment or contract or invoices. And as of um, February 27th, it was a long, about five year process, but we finally did it during COVID actually, that we switched to completely elect electronic process or electronic certification for our vendors and made it um, a lot user friendly because now it's the computer away. They don't have to mail anything. Mail doesn't get lost, so on and so forth. They just get to upload all the information um, in our, on our portal. Next slide, please. And again, eligibility requirements for uh, Indian and veteran owned small businesses are very um, um, similar. Uh, that's ownership again, 51%. We look at control as well. And uh, we all, we obviously for veteran owned businesses, we use, um, we need to determine if they're a veteran or on active duty by asking per, uh, by asking the uh, relevant info for relevant information. Christina, I think you asked what program we use. Uh, here we have uh, the Oracle or PeopleSoft. So we um, made the custom, customized basically electronic certification and built it on our current data registration profile that is already that already existed. And we also had repository uh, of our uh, minority women and veteran-owned businesses. So we built on that. It's customized custom made internally by Indiana's Office of Technology. So, uh, and for veteran owned businesses, we also accept the federal certification, which is uh, Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. So they can be certified with, our, with federal 
uh, government or the state of Indiana. And again, their certification is also electronic. Next slide, please. So um, we have uh, one of the biggest wins and one of the biggest successes that we've had was the contract compliance. And I will talk a little bit why it, and how it, was, it used to be a challenge. And what it looks now is what you're looking at basically now. Um, which is we have either proactive process or reactive process. And right in front of you, we have displayed the proactive process when um, there's an award that's made, as I said earlier, and partly uh, that award was made because at the evaluation stage, the respondents who have uh, minority women and veteran-owned participation get 25% more scoring. Um, so they, they won the bid and then um, now they have to uh, fulfill their commitment. However, that's not always the case. When we are um, looking at the award that has made and it's been about three or four months and we do not see any movement in our what we call pay audit system. Pay audit system is our contract compliance tool um, you might have heard within the industry like B, B2G, like business to government, we use pay audit, that's again, um, that's again uh, something that is a contract compliance tool for us. Uh, then we basically pop up and say, hey, this award was made and you have not really started utilizing these subcontractors, what's your plan? So I would say nine times out of 10, we are very successful in mediating and navigating through prime subcontractor relationship. And um, if we are not, uh, then we ask questions, what happened and, and why? So it's always good to start this proactive process in the beginning of the contract term, of course, because it's harder to track and it's harder to let the, and get the primes utilize the subcontractors towards the end of the contract. So, that's a done through proactive process. Next slide, please. And then there is reactive process. And reactive process really means that throughout the contract, um, things change, right? And we understand. My favorite phrases and my contract compliance team knows we have common sense. I know people are surprised, but we do have common sense. Um, we just ask the right questions. And those right questions are when the, um, the change is, um, requested to the uh, from the division of supply diversity to remove decrease increase add uh, sub minority woman or a veteran and sub veteran owned subcontractor we always ask a question why and when we ask the question and again if uh, especially throughout covid right things change drastically and what the state was going to buy provide produce changed as well. So we ask the question and we always say, well, what could be done? What can be done in order to avoid the decreasing percentage or removing the subcontractor? And we'll try our best to do that. If not, then we will, um, we will uh, have to approve or disapprove the request made by the agency or the prime and sometimes by the subcontractor. They don't want to participate on a prime contract anymore and then we notify all the parties. So these are kind of proactive and reactive processes when we talk about contract compliance for the Division of Supply Diversity. Next slide, please. Then that was um, uh, function number two. So function number one was certification of minority women veterans, uh, making sure that we de uh, determine their eligibility and then we issue certification. Our process, certification process state, based on the regulations is 90 days um, after we have a file, completed file. Uh, however, we always strive to decrease the number of days to get certified and average as of now is a little bit over 30 days. So that's very successful uh, for the CERT team. Contract compliance, we talked about um, the team that does proactive and reactive and that's their uh, that's their air they breathe, breathe and live with on a daily basis because as you might imagine, there are many things that many contracts that are being, um, uh, and uh, awards that are being made on a daily basis for the entire state. And now uh, function number three, business development outreach throughout the year, 
we offer various uh, resources and various outreach events to our uh, diverse vendors, whether that's certification workshops or um, bi-monthly webinars, pay audit, again, that's our contract compliance tool, bi-monthly webinars, business conferences around the state of Indiana, prior to COVID, after COVID, Governor's Commission on Supply and Diversity, public meetings, you name it. Through, during COVID, actually, because we weren't, weren't out there, but there were so many questions that our vendors had, we had over 50 webinars just in 2020. So when we continue to the, this hybrid uh, version you mentioned earlier, Christina, um, uh, up, up till um, today as well. So networking uh, uh, opportunities for our vendors, like some of them mentioned today, are we know are very essential, and we make sure that we give the uh, uh, get in the room the decision makers when we go in the uh, regions, local stakeholders and uh, make that introduction and have those uh, build those relationships as well as providing educational resources. Next slide, please. And um, what I want to, so I'm transitioning from day to day now to a bigger picture. And what I want to, I wanted to provide the um, disparity study information very shortly because we, uh, these types of programs need legal basis and our legal um, basis which is quantitative and qualitative data of the statistical analysis of utilization i know big words that's why we call the disparity study um, is something that state of indiana by law the same law that i referenced earlier is required to conduct on uh, every five years so every five years a state spends about a million dollars to look at the availability uh, of minority women and uh, well, we added veterans this time, but mostly minority and women and the utilization of such minority and women businesses on state contracts. Next slide, please. And you see that it, it was almost a two year process, right? By the time the RFP is done, by the time the disparity study is done, because it looks at five year data. And as you might imagine, it's a lot of numbers and a lot of quantitative and qualitative data. So based on 2020 uh, disparity study findings uh, or disparity study, the, uh, the third party uh, uh, consultant is who we secure for such studies because we want it to be impartial, unbiased study to give us the actual numbers, um, normally comes up with recommendations and what they call findings. So there were six of them, six major ones in this um, uh, 2020 study, but I wanted to point out the, uh, the four that are of the crucial as well, and we've already started doing something about them. Data collection was number one. And I mentioned that, um, pay audit system and I mentioned the that it's uh, we track the participation that way however uh, pay audit system is um, at mercy of a prime contractor and a subcontractor in other words they have to create their profiles come in and record the payments to the sub the primes payments to the subcontractors and subcontractors um, now from their side need to verify these payments so we are basically um, the ones reminding the primes. Sometimes prime, primes are proactive and because it's actually in the boilerplate of the contract as well. However, you know, they, again, they uh, forget, which is okay. We pop up and remind them, but again, it's not real time data. So we are working with our information uh, technology office to see how we can improve and how, what are the ideas that uh, we can come up with to record these um, participation numbers and goal, account, goal attainment better. We're also working with uh, different uh, agencies to make sure that when they administer the, the contracts, they understand that they need to tell the prime contractors to um, uh, record such data. So, IDOA, the Indiana Department of Administration, Administration is a purchasing authority for um, many state agencies, not all of them, but majority of them. So all the purchasing, all the RFP processes are done here. So 
our procurement division has everyday real-time interaction with agencies, other state agencies, and that's what we use to communicate to them. Finding number two was very interesting finding, um, and it, it basically showed us that out of um, uh, around 2,000 uh, certified minority and women businesses, uh, actually 200, only 200, which is about 10% are being utilized for, um, uh, for the state contract. So we want to make sure that we diversify the, the diverse uh, pool of vendors. And for that reason, Governor's Commission on Supplier Diversity that I mentioned earlier, created subcommittee to that meet on a monthly basis to look at these lists. And of course we want those 200 to keep having businesses, but what is it that they're doing that they could be maybe mentoring other uh, diverse businesses as well? Yes, uh, so uh, absolutely. Next slide, please. And that next slide is something that will show, um, next slide, yeah, finding number three and four, that it was there was a significant disparities, um, disparities for all minority groups and women as well. So that meant that we needed to increase goals, participation goals for such businesses. Next slide, please. And you will see that the current uh, or the goals, uh, it, it should be the past goals uh, until July 1st, 2021 used to be, and I'm not, I know we are running out of time. You, you can all see and um, uh, see these areas of construction, professional services and goods and supplies and goals as of July 1st, 2021 were significantly increased in goods and services and professional services while they remained the same in construction. What that means is that there was more, there were more minority and women uh, businesses available that then they were utilized on state contracts. So Governor's Commission on Supply and Diversity establishes these goals and then the entire state of Indiana operates under these goals afterwards. So now getting to the, the, the interesting part, right? The challenges that we overcame and what were these challenges? There was little or, or no contract compliance. And now explaining what proactive and reactive processes mean, I hope you can uh, appreciate the, uh, the part where it was why it was challenging that there is no, uh, there is no compliance. There were, um, again, uh, at least uh, two other disparity studies also showed that there were significant disparities for all minority groups and women. And there was really not a clear um, vision or direction until um, three or I would say four years ago, and then uh, lack of support for, from the leadership to do something about it. Next slide, please. And then we uh, decided, and based on the, and I will uh, talk about how we did it, decided that we needed to establish a good contract compliance to make sure that primes were not getting away by removing or decreasing participation for the subcontractors. And now no one can do that unless they come and uh, have, get a letter signed by me, Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Supply Diversity, approving their request for any kind of change. So this caused chain reaction because now, and all the contracts are approved at the IDOA, um, general counsel will not sign off of a contract if the bid uh, package or award letter and responses and the contract does not match with the original uh, RFP package. And that's very, very important because we found places where primes had pledged and then contract never reflected the subcontractor participation. Most importantly, we had buy-in from leadership and that goes back to intentional. Leadership is and is now intentional about supplier diversity. And I always say our program is as good and as supportive and as strong as the IDOA commissioner. And most importantly, state educational institutions, there's seven of them. And we are talking about Purdue University, Indiana University, Ivy Tech, big, big colleges, now report to the Governor's Commission on Supplier Diversity on a quarterly basis versus uh, yearly basis. And uh, they are now the ones who are talking to the vendors and the Governor's uh, Commission on Supplier Diversity and have more visibility on their projects. So next slide, please. How we did it was um, by all means a joint effort by the Governor, 
um, Governor Holcomb uh, as, uh, assigned and appointed uh, the new DNI uh, a person who is uh, basically involved in every diversity, equity, inclusion uh, initiative within the state of Indiana. Commission on Governors, uh, Governors Commission of Supply Diversity. We have legislators on the commission. We have the chairman who is the executive director of Indiana Civil Rights Commission. We have business owners. The legislators are also members of the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. So we have all the buy-in on and everybody represented uh, that we, everybody that we can be possibly represented at the Governor's Commission of Supply Diversity. IDOA leadership, again, uh, commissioner. Commissioner uh, then and commissioner now, uh, they are very, very supportive of the Division of Supply Diversity. Of course, the SD team, I can have great policies and guidance, but it's it's done by the team within and vendor community, most importantly. We listen to them, get their feedback, and then make, make these changes accordingly. For example, because of the state education institution reportedly reporting, now um, they, these big universities have an opportunity to, opportunity to hear from vendor community themselves about the challenges on getting contracts in their colleges and schools. And um, also the, having these open dialogues with the vendors and not being afraid for the feedback. And that also gets into the educating all stakeholders. Sometimes we assume everybody knows about supplier diversity, but sometimes even state, uh, state agencies don't know we exist. So we are always here to educate them and never, never, ever giving up. And you see minions, they are my, my and my daughter's favorite. So I had to put them in here and say, we did it. Now, how you can do it, next slide, please. That um, again, our humble recommendation to Wichita and uh, University or our state of Kansas in general is that consider creating some kind of board or agency or a commission just like ours that is a high level, and uh, again, our case, it's appointed by the governor himself, that will hold this, hold the division or hold the department accountable for such gender and race conscious program. Of course, you have to have leadership buy-in and support. There's, there's no way, no other way, no other better way to do it because that's where it gets intentional and trickles down to the other agency heads as well as middle managers. And um, hearing and listening to the vendor community because that's the real feedback, real-time feedback that we get from them to see how and what needs are there. And um, I talked about, you know, I like talking about this not reinventing the wheel because somebody already went through this. And we at the division constantly do the research and see and contact other agencies or other states that might have had the similar um, experiences or even the city of Indianapolis or even the uh, INDA, Department of Transportation that has similar uh, disadvantaged program. And of course, of course, find the team that's passionate because this supplier diversity is hard. It, it is not easy to have these uncomfortable conversations and without a passionate team, we could not do this. We could not have these um, achievements that we have had in past just three to four years without a very dedicated team, because again, this program is not for everyone. And last but not least, please don't give up. Keep having these initiatives, keep talking about it, and don't give up. There will be days you will get discouraged, but that should not give you the reason to give up. And I apologize for speaking so, so much faster, but I wanted to give you all the information. Next slide, please. And if you still have questions and if you still would like to talk about it more, please either talk us through Christina um, or uh, contact us and here's our contact information. Thank you so much for this time. Maya, let's give her a hand. I want to say thank you for giving us the fullness of your presentation because I know in us preparing it was really important for you to share all of the steps that you all have um, experienced in order to make such a comprehensive change and you being willing to be an ongoing resource to us not only virtually but in this room we appreciate your grace and extension particularly through the early tech challenges but we hit our stride and you did that.
Thank you so very much for your time. Um, Maya is going to allow us to share her slides, and so you all will be receiving those following this presentation as well. Uh, thank you again for joining us from Indiana, and we look forward to continued collaboration with you. Okay. So now we are going to transition into our breakout sessions. And if you are a minority business uh, contractor, vendor, supplier, you're gonna be hearing from Darius Wright of Kansas Business Services on ways to get your firm in front of purchasing professionals. Uh, Darius will be meeting you all over on this side. And then if you are a procurement professional, um, you all will be hearing from LaShonda Garns of Fidelity Bank, next slide. And she will be talking about ways to create a corporate culture, culture that supports inclusion. We're now dismissed. Thank you all so much. You will make a mistake in this world when you enter into this space. And if we don't create any risk tolerance, if we don't create room for a failure, then we will get paralyzed by fear of doing something wrong, saying the wrong thing, not knowing what's next or the unknown. And so this messaging created room for me to bring in the conversation of, we have gotta be curious if we wanna make progress. We have to give ourselves permission to give grace to self and to others if we want to make progress. The third part of the messaging was our most important people are our assets. So if our people are the most important asset, then guess what? Diversity matters because our people are diverse. Equity matters because we want to make sure that everyone has access to equal opportunity, right? Inclusion matters because we want to foster a sense of belonging so that they will come into the space and join us in our conversations. So this is going the opposite way. There we go. The other statement was making our culture the catalyst for every decision. Huh, what is culture? It's our people. People make up our culture. So if our people are our most important asset, if we want to make our culture the catalyst for every decision, we are already sharing the message that inclusion, equity, and diversity matters. It matters that we're being intentional about infusing this into our workplace. And it is important for us to be thinking about this, not only from the perspective of our workforce, but our customer, our community, because if they are the catalyst of every decision that we make, it is important for us to be thinking intentionally about how do we invite people into our space? How do we create spaces where people can see themselves as a part of our Fidelity family? How do we do this work in a very intentional and purposeful way so that we can hold true to this idea that our decisions are gonna be based off of our culture being the catalyst to the drive that we are, are moving our work forward in. So I entered into a space with barriers initially, but I entered into a space where they had already cultivated the ground for this work to take place in Fidelity in a very intentional way. And so that led to more conversations as we determined, what do we name our department? How do we be cool kids out here, right? Gotta start with inclusion. We had to choose inclusion first because if I can foster the environment of, of belonging, if I can foster the, the environment of value, the other things have a natural way of coming into the organization and they are actually aspects that can be well received by the other folks in the room because we've already started talking about the value of inclusivity. We've already started teaching about inclusive leadership and showing up in ways that allow us to enter spaces authentically with a little bit of vulnerability. And if we can exemplify that as leaders, those that are coming around us, coming along with us, coming after us, can see the foundation and the examples that we need to set in order to move this work forward in a very intentional way. And then finally, I shared with you earlier that I came in the room like, okay, I have these conversations. I don't have relationship. I don't have capital to pour out, right? 
because I'm still trying to build my bucket here. And I have to have these difficult conversations virtually. It is nothing like walking in the room and saying, well, why do you do that? Right? I'm the new kid on the block. Why do you want to know? But because the foundation had been set and I had, I have not had, I have impeccable leadership that support boldly and flat footed that this work is important. You cannot enter this space without having support of your executive leadership team. It makes the work way more difficult. But when my CEO says this work matters, I'm committed, we're on a journey, we're going to do it, I'm invested, the ears of others perk up. When I say it, what do you want me to do? You're adding to my job, right? But as long as I can continue to have the support of the executive leadership in a very powerful, out front and meaningful way, the work will continue because people will get a hold of the vision of where the organization wants to go and separate it from that's LaShonda's work. Because it's not my work. Let me be clear. It is not my work alone. It is the work of the organization. And so as we went into this, I also believe it's very important that if we're on a lead with inclusion, that we should exemplify inclusive leadership. So as we developed our program and we developed the process, one of the things that was really important to me was to hear the voices of the people. So while I was in an observance mode, I also wanted to listen for understanding. Listening to understand what did success look like to my frontline employee? What does their perspective of the culture look like today? Where do they want to see us go? And after listening to, we listened to about 50% of our employees. They actually engaged in town hall meetings, team meetings, one-on-one -on -one interviews. Anyone could be a part of the conversation. You just had to show up. We had over 50% of our employees across all of our markets participate in this listening session that happened for about two months. Pretty exciting to me. I don't know if that number is exciting to you, but it's real exciting to me. And what we got from that is, is that people recognize this work is hard and it is going to take time and that we are on a journey and this is not about the moment. The moment drives some of the work, but the moment is not all of the work. And if we are not on this journey together, we're going to have to figure out if we're in the right seat on the boat. Right? We also recognize in that, that this is everybody's work. It requires action from everyone that is a part of the Fidelity family. And we have to make sure that we are infusing that energy into the conversations so that when we get to this place of implementing the work, that everyone can see themselves as a part of the work. So if we do it right, we know that we can attract, retain, and advance talent better. We know that when we have diversity of people within our workforce, it allows us to be more imaginative. It allows us to solve problems different. Because guess what? If I can bring in an experience that you did not have, I will probably bring in a different solution or help us to think about a solution different, differently, right? This allows me to attract diverse customers, because if I am solving problems differently, more imaginative and innovative, if I am developing products and services with the other thoughts in mind, I have an ability to attract customers that I am, attract new customers and retain the ones that I have because I am more responsive to their need. I'm gonna jump to the bottom because we're on time. One of the things I leave with you is, is that this is no longer a compliance mandate, y'all. It's a business imperative. It is a business imperative because when we do all of the other things, it does have a direct impact on your financial performance. Here's a couple things to think about. When you lose talent, turnover costs. When you hire new talent, new costs to bring them on board. 
right? When you don't solve problems effectively for your customers, a loss of a customer. When you're not creating new solutions to bring in the customers you're trying to attract, they're going somewhere else. The market is lucrative for them to find another bank in my particular industry. And so if I want to attract, retain, and continue to think about how our demographics are changing, I need to have a workforce that represents that. And I also need to have a workforce who can think about barriers, can think about needs, can think about challenges so that we are developing products and services to meet the need of our growing change in demographics. So four key things to take away. When you enter the space, begin with self. If you can't change nobody else in the world, you can change you. Assess and engage your environment, take action and measure progress. When you think about beginning with self, it is heart and hard work. There are some things we have to unlearn. There are some new things we need to learn and sometimes it's hard. Be authentic with yourself. If you can't tell yourself the truth, you for real won't tell anybody else the truth. And if you can't own the truth about walking into rooms with a bias, who, who in this room does not have a bias? Thank you. I thought I was gonna have to stay after class with somebody today. But every one of us have a bias and we walk into rooms and those biases are things that help drive how we make decisions, how we treat people, how we respond, how we show up. Own those truths and be willing to pause for a moment to think about how your bias is impacting your business, is impacting your leadership style, is impacting your profit and how you are moving in the continuum of things. The last one I'll point out on here is give yourself permission to give grace to self. We freely give grace to everybody else. But when it comes to us giving ourselves grace, we hesitate. We are our own worst critics. Give yourself permission. When you assess and engage, do an internal and external scan. Know what others say about you. You might think you're a good leader, but somebody else may think differently. You might think your business is the best business out here, but that might not be the perceptions of others. And those are the blind spots that we should be looking for. So do an internal and external scan to understand what others are saying about you. What are the stories others tell? Do an organizational profile. Compare your organizational profile to the customer base you serve, to the communities you're, you're within. You can also compare it internally. Does your diversity stop at your frontline employees? Is it throughout your organization? Is it a problem departmentally? So there are a lot of ways you can look at your organizational profile to see where there are opportunities. Equity, look at your policies. Many times we create a policy, it's working, nobody's complaining, and we never look at it. Doesn't mean that there's not a problem. It could mean that you haven't created a psychological safe space for people to raise the bar that there's an inequity in that policy because of the fear of retaliation the fear of not being invited into the room again. So make sure that there are things in place that allow you to evaluate policies, both from a people perspective, procedurally, how you're developing products, so that if there is an opportunity to enhance what you are doing, because the environment has changed, the needs are changing, that it's a consistent process that you're doing. Don't miss out on the low hanging fruit, right? This is a journey, but there are some small things and small wins that we can get along the way so that people can see progress as we are getting to the big bang over here. All voices matter, no matter what. All voices matter. Engage all of the voices, all of your stakeholders. Here's the caution. If you are not willing to adjust your decision, your position, don't engage, just inform. There is a difference between informing people and engaging people and know which stage you're in, okay? Last thing that I will share is a couple of examples of low-hanging fruit, things that we've done in the last five to six months. 
We have implemented a new website internally only because that's where our focus is right now for people to have a landing space to know what we're doing. We have a landing space for people to share feedback openly and anonymously. You want both because we haven't really created the safe spaces yet for people to give us the full truth. We've created a glossary so that we understand language. So they were having common language in our workspace. It is an adaptable glossary. We update it on a quarterly basis. So they were constantly listening for conversations and opportunities. We implemented the use of personal pronouns that was an optional activity, but it was a way for us to foster inclusivity as low hanging fruit. The only requirement was is that if you did implement using personal pronouns, you also had to link it to an educational document that talked about what are personal pronouns, how does it foster inclusivity, and this is about respecting the individual. Not telling you to agree with choice, I'm telling you to respect the individual. The last thing we did, that I'll share in this space is, we also offer a diversity PTO day. We recognize as a bank, we only close on federal holidays. Well, that doesn't cover a lot of culture. So because of that, we wanted to create opportunity to support our workforce by providing them with an opportunity to go and celebrate an observance that is important to them and or go out and learn about another culture that they're curious about. And so we've done some low hanging fruit over the last four to five months. Again, I've been in this role since February. Um, so we are making progress swiftly as the organization would allow me to do that virtually. Um, and we are working towards a strategic roadmap that we have engaged the, the organization to provide input in. And we're looking to implement that um, at the beginning of our fiscal year in April of 2022. Questions? Rapid fire. It's all in one. Okay. Yep. It jointly infuses. So I'm a firm believer of open space for conversation and curiosity. Just because we come into a space and have a conversation does not mean we're gonna walk out in agreement. And I'm okay with respecting your differences. What I do require you to do is to come into the room and have an authentic conversation with me and a respectful conversation so that we can learn from one another. Because there could be some things that I can learn from you and gain better understanding as to why you think the way that you do. So my job is to create the space so that we can have that authentic dialogue, understanding that the number one thing is that we walk away respecting one another not necessarily that we will agree. And so if we can remove this idea that we're gonna always build consensus, it will make people a little bit more comfortable in having some of these conversations because we will not remove differences. Any other questions? So start with self, right? Start with self and be willing to own some of the truths you have within you. Do the hard work of identifying where you have bias and how it could show up in your workspace. Begin the conversation, right? It's the small thing is having a space to be curious, to have conversations about the work and try something, right? It doesn't have to be major, but try something to get the momentum going. You have to find a place to start. And one place we started initially was trying to create common language. And that created a whole bunch of conversations. It pissed off some people in the process, but it created a space for us to start having conversations and to understand what is on the minds and the hearts of the people that we are trying to make impact with, right? The other place to start is, what does success look like? I got, a, I got a decision in my head and I could have come into Fidelity real easy and was like, here's the best practices, here's the book, let's go. But instead, I wanted to understand what did success look like to the individual who had to implement? 
or had to deal with the consequences of the decisions we implemented or had to define that, yep, we are making progress. That is successful. I wanted to hear those voices. So when we get to our strategic roadmap, people can see themselves in it. If I can see myself in it, I am more likely to participate. If you gave me a whole bunch of best practices that you pulled off of best practice land, maybe not so much, right? Because it's not fidelified, as, as I would say, or whatever your business is, it doesn't have that uniqueness that they're looking for to buy into it. So from the listening session perspective, it was this kiddo right here talking to everybody. From the sharing feedback long term, we use an anonymous portable, a portal that goes outside of the network that does not report any other information and not, I am the only one who have access to it. The one that is open and you willing to tell me who you are, it's internal and let's go for it because that means you wanna have a dialogue. And so what we've created is, is that anonymously, if you don't want to tell me who you are, just know that there's no exchange that we can have. And if we're not in alignment, there's nothing I can do about it. So balancing out if you really want to have conversations about it or if you want to report something and thus being able to find out where it should land. We've gotten some feedback in the anonymous space. At one point, people were writing letters. I was like, okay, y'all, we got to do something different because I can't read letters. So um, a lot of what it is is more curiosity that we're getting from anonymous spaces about policies, about who can, wear, who can show tattoos, who can't show tattoos. You know, so a lot of it has been more on an equitable perspective more than it has been anything else. Um, on the one that is pretty open where people share, it's a lot of people sharing ideas who may not have a, um, participated in the listening sessions when we first did it because they were trying to figure out who was LaShonda and why she asking me these questions. And then they got a little bit more comfortable because I wasn't as scary as it appeared to be. And then they started sending feedback as, as, and they were using that channel in that way. So we did, um, we did a, an amazing video. We have an amazing marketing team and we created an, a video to invite people to be a part of the process. And what we did was, is that we described what diversity was main in this video. So we're going to Because what we ran up against rooms, was everybody so thinks about diversity. Everyone back Let me take, say that session. differently. A lot of people think about diversity from the perspective of race. And we miss to, to say, we want to hear your voice. If you, if and we want to hear the diversity of perspective within our organization, so if you think about it from race, from sex, on, uh, from religion, to from social, back, economics, from philosophical beliefs, whatever it was, we put all the diversity terms out there, we want to hear from you. And, you and it is right a now. constant reaction, video that sits on our internal um, website. We also show that video on onboarding so we can make sure and with all of our new hires so that as they enter the organization, they know what our expectations are about this space. Oh, you're still hearing Ken and me too. Okay. Go ahead and put the sound back to here and uh, get the video. I mean, so um, I don't have goals for our um, short answer, but what I do know is is that when I get my house in order internally to be thinking about, so the six goals we're going to be focusing on are education internally, talent from beginning to advancement, well, I'm gonna tell you um, education and you advocacy externally, oh my community engagement and outreach, okay. equity and transparency, <laughs> and I might have missed one, but you got me. <laughs> and so in that process of oh, doing boy. that, we will identify our strategies that are going to be very oh. specific. So since we made an intentional decision to focus internally first, the only work that I've been working in from an external perspective is connecting with all of our chambers in each of our markets so that we can start to identify how we have very intentional presence in the communities in which we serve and where the needs are so that we are not showing up artificially, but with some intention on how we want to brand the work that we're doing in the communities that we have impact in. And so 
the short of that is, is that we will get to some very specific strategies on the external facing side. What we're hearing is, is more volunteer opportunities um, in communities of, in more diverse communities. What we're hearing is how do we um, tell our story differently about the things that we're doing to support the communities that we're in. And we'll also, the last one was supplier diversity. So we're looking at developing our own supplier diversity policies internally so that we can be a part of that ecosystem and making sure that we have the economic impact that we would like to have as well. So for those of you who are in the room, how are the breakouts? They did all right? Can we give a hand clap for our presenters? We can advance the slide, please. So again, why we wanted to bring everyone together um, for this symposium is because there have been so many conversations that have been happening in uh, offices and in organizations and among our businesses related to supplier diversity. We want to be able to go beyond the conversation while awareness is important, action is so important as well. And there's a lot of action that's happening that can be amplified when we're aware of what's happening within one another's organizations, when we're inspired and encouraged to be brave and stretch beyond what we know to something that can, again, cause more uh, progress in this effort. And just to be in community with one another, tackling this issue together. So I thank you for that. I keep referring and alluding to some breaking news. We do have Rhonda Harris from the Kansas Department of Commerce's Office of Minority and Women Business Development. Now, Rhonda was planning to travel here from Topeka, but she is being a great citizen and servant serving on jury duty. Instead of backing completely out, she took a moment to record a special message for us that I think you all find quite important and significant to this work. Good morning. I'm sorry that I can't be in person today, but I'm grateful that I can still share valuable information regarding upcoming legislation our office is hoping to get past this upcoming legislative session. As you may know, the state of Kansas does not require nor encourage contracting or procurement opportunities with women and minority owned businesses on a state level. This does not include federal contracts. And because of this, too often minority women disadvantaged businesses are left behind as vendors and do not have the same opportunities as others. This situation has also led to frustration on the part of many women and minority business owners who are discouraged to even seek state contracts. That's why in 2020, the Kansas Department of Commerce took the initiative to move forward with a proposal to assist minority women, disadvantaged, and veteran business enterprises within the state of Kansas procurement and contracting system. Our goal was to address the inequity in assessing the state's procurement and contracting process. The proposed procurement program will provide valuable opportunities for those historically disadvantaged groups and create a more level playing field. Our efforts began with the assistance of a small working committee, which consisted of representatives from the state level, federal agencies, as well as minority and local chambers, corporation representatives, and small business owners. These individuals have long outstanding efforts and knowledge on supplier diversity practices in procurement and contracting arena. Also, I want to mention that the Secretary of Commerce, Lieutenant Governor David Tolan has shown a great interest in this effort and has been helpful in guiding us through this legislative process. So we are very appreciative of his assistance. We were preparing to share the proposed drafted bill with interested stakeholders such as yourselves and present the bill during the 2021 legislative session. But COVID-19 happened and our plan was put on hold. Our goal now is to present this bill during the 2022 legislative session. The proposed bill is currently being drafted by the Kansas Revisor of Statutes office. So our next step is to make sure stakeholders are aware of this proposed bill. 
and to begin putting together a plan of action to introduce the bill in February of 2022. It should be noted that we do not believe there would be enough support for a specific set aside component to the program and could detract from the ability to get a program up and running. For this reason, we went towards a goal oriented program, which would be set by each agency with consultation from the Minority Women Business Office and the Advisory Committee. Let me provide some key points regarding the bill. And I will just share my screen. The program would be titled Minority Women Disadvantaged Service Disabled Business Enterprise Procurement Program. The oversight of the program, the oversight of the procurement program will be with the Office of Minority and Women Business Development within the Kansas Department of Commerce. We plan to work in collaboration with the Kansas Department of Administration, Procurement and Contracts Office. A summary of actions would include the following. Establish an advisory committee to assist in the development of policies to carry out the program. Develop, plan and implement programs to provide an opportunity for participation by qualified enterprises in public works and the process by which goods and services are procured. Establish annual overall goals and identify any barriers to equal participation by certified and qualified enterprises in all state agencies and post-secondary educational institution contracts. Develop and maintain a central certification list for all state agencies and post-secondary educational institutions. Develop, implement, and operate a system of monitoring compliance with this act and investigate complaints of violations. Additional program details include each state agency shall adopt a plan developed in consultation with the Kansas Department of Commerce, Office of Minority and Women Business Development and the advisory committee. Each state agency's plan shall include specific measures the agency will undertake to increase the participation of certified business enterprises. Each state agency shall comply with the annual goals established for that agency or institution. Each state agency must present a good faith effort to meet the prescribed goals of the contract. Next steps. Our next steps for legislative preparation include creating a master list of stakeholders that could be impacted, have an interest and or provide support for this proposed legislation. Next, share the summary of the drafted bill. When ready, we will share the full proposed bill prepared by the, the Revisor of Statutes Office. We're also thinking of conducting a survey to determine the business environment as we move forward. This will help us as we prepare to gain supporters. We will also develop a timeline of activities leading up to the introduction of the bill. Lastly, prepare for a potential hearing, which could include obtaining written testimonies and oral testimonies. So in summary, our end goal is to provide equity in accessing state contracts awarded by the state of Kansas and allowing increased opportunities for minority women, disadvantaged and service disabled veterans to be awarded contracts and have the ability to perform on these contracts. By doing this, we invest in and contribute to the growth and development of Kansas small minority women, disadvantaged businesses by putting people back to work and increasing consumer and business purchasing, which directly contributes to increased profitability for the state. So I conclude my presentation today. I ask that if you want to receive a copy of the bill when it is ready, 
And if you wish to be notified of upcoming action on this bill, please notify me. I have included my contact information. At this time, the best contact would be my email, rhonda.harris at ks.gov. I thank you for your time and look forward to hearing from you in the near future. Thank you. Wonderful news. They've been working on this for several years, several different iterations, and it looks like we have an opportunity. You can advance the slide for it to continue on. And again, it's a collaborative effort. On your tables, there is a slide that just basically asks for you all to share what practices are happening within your organizations, your companies. We're gonna be putting together um, this information and it will uh, be housed and shared from the Create Campaign website. Again, we're not doing this work alone. Each and every one of you all are contributing to this work. We're just trying to organize it and broaden again the voices around this conversation locally. With that being said, um, I have one announcement that I will make as well and that is um, we talk about next steps, learning from this. And so I wanna be able to offer some time slots. If your organization would like to sit down with me and just talk and converse, we're gonna have some virtual coffees that we're gonna be opening up. Um, we do have a list, there's multiple lists of diverse suppliers. We'll do matchmaking, we'll do introductions. We just want the work to, again, move forward. And sometimes it takes a little more organic grassroots type approach to it instead of a top down, but we're, we're gonna work at both angles if that's all right. Is that all right? Very good. So um, there is a survey that we would like for you all to uh, complete following this and you will receive a follow-up email from me, but we cannot leave without hearing from our venue host and that is Kay Muck Morgan from Wichita State University. After her voice, you all are dismissed. Okay, thank you so much. I've never been like going home. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, at, good morning. Uh, it's so good to see all of you all. Welcome to Wichita State University on behalf of our 15th president, Dr. Richard Muma. We're glad to have you on our campus and a part of Shocker Nation today. Uh, I wanna thank Christina for allowing me just a few minutes to come and share with you, to thank you for being here uh, and to, to talk a little bit about how, where Wichita State is in this space um, and, to, and why we're hosting or, or partnering with her in this particular effort. Uh, you all know that Wichita State has gone through a significant change in leadership over the last couple of years. Uh, our new university president finds this uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion to be a very foremost part of his administrative um, tenure, goals, objectives, you name it, it shows up everywhere. Uh, and if you've heard him speak, you'll know that that uh, is a message that elevates out of, uh, a, a genuine message that elevates out of his heart. Um, one of the first things that happened when I took over this role as the Vice President for Strategic Engagement and Planning, I've been at Wichita State for almost 30 years, but in this particular role for only about 18 months. I got a phone call from my friend uh, who is known in the community for being forthright and a truth teller to ask me about some of the work that had been happening on Wichita State's innovation campus and what our uh, practices and protocols were as it relates to minority vendor uh, and diversity issues with regard to, to vendors and contracts. And I got to dig in because when your friend uh, asks you a pointed question as she is known to do, the intrepid import reporter that she is at her <laughs> core, uh, you know that you need to find an answer for her that will not only satisfy or answer the question, but that will leave you at peace. And my answer did not leave me at peace. It did not leave me at peace. Uh, what, what we discovered is that Wichita State had not actually fully engaged in diversity vendor identification or support. And so that was really, uh, we all took a, a big swallow and said, oh my goodness, we clutched our pearls a little bit and said, well, let's, let us get on that right away. Uh, and so one of the first uh, activities we took was to pull together a group of folks just to start having conversations and several of them are here Dr. Marcia Stevens with the Small Business Development Center, certainly Wayne Bell with the Small Business Administration, uh, Christina, KBS, probably six or seven people and said, okay, let's look at what we're doing and more importantly, what we're not doing and how do we correct, get on the right path as uh, we like to believe ourselves to be uh, per our mission an economic driver in the state of Kansas and beyond. Uh, and it appeared that perhaps we weren't living fully into that vision and that mission of driving 
uh, economic prosperity for all of our business community. And so we got to work uh, almost a year ago now of starting to have conversation and meetings and pulling things apart to see what we were doing and how we were doing it and elevating some practices. Uh, we've had several, not several, we've had two uh, leadership changes in our Office of uh, Procurement. And so that gave us yet another opportunity uh, to elevate some practices and to see retirement can be a really wonderful thing for some folks, whether or not we, um, wh what were the steps and the intentions behind our work? And one of the things that we determined was that we didn't have a software platform that allowed us to facilitate the discussion. So even pulling the data on minority biz businesses or vendors uh, who were interested in working with Wichita State was a real challenge for us. Folks had to self-identify and they had to do it every time uh, they submitted a contract or responded to an RFP or an RFP. Uh, that was difficult and, and an extra barrier and burden on those folks who wanted to do business with us. And so uh, with the on, uh, onboarding of our new president, we've identified, we're in the process of identifying a software system. Those of you, and I can see around the room, many of you have familiarity with large enterprise systems where all of your software needs to talk with one another and your HR system and your procurement system and your student system, well, you might not have a student system, some of you do, um, all need to connect in ways where those, that information can be pulled. And so one of the biggest barriers we found is who's a software provider who can build a system for us that does this in addition to all the other things. And then how do we prioritize the purchase of that system? Again, in an institution like ours where um, people will pay for buildings because those are pretty and you can put your name on them. Nobody wants to buy software. <laughs> there isn't a, you know, software system by Wayne Bell. You might be able to get one, <laughs> right? Um, so we had to really talk about, okay, what are the software systems? What's available? How does that work with the systems that we currently have? And then set up a budget priority in order for, uh, for that work to be elevated. And so we're right now in the process of um, looking at different vendors that will help us to better identify, um, taking, getting away from spreadsheets in Excel, 21st century, and some of our stuff was still on an Excel spreadsheet. Actually, it still is on an Excel spreadsheet, but we're gonna get it off as soon as we can find some software uh, and allocate those funds. The president is committed to this work. Uh, we've been working with, we brought on a, a consulting firm to look at our processes. One of the things that we learned is that we, for plumbing, for example, we don't do a, um, a bid process for every plumbing project that we do. Every five years, we go out and do an RFP to select five or six plumbers that can serve on call. News to me, didn't know that was the deal. So if we do it every five years and you're not in the queue when that five-year bid comes up, then guess what? You gotta wait another five years to get in the queue to, to have that opportunity. Um, so we are, are working with our community partners in order to make sure that that bid information is pushed far and wide, not just on a website, which is what we were doing, um, but that we're going to get that out to more folks. Uh, I know that Troy Broom, some of you probably know our, our new, um, not new to Wichita State, but in a new role, has engaged with other um, folks in the community that are doing this work. It was clear to us that we were behind and oftentimes, and particularly as an educational institution that prides itself on innovation, we want to be the leader. Um, we had to swallow and realize that we weren't leading, but there were some that were, and how do we partner with them so that we can scale and we can scale quickly, learn from those things that you all, the lessons you all have already um, conquered. And so I think we're well on our way. I understand that, that Troy is setting in meetings and making phone calls frequently uh, to get up to speed. And so being here today and having you on our campus is just another extension of our commitment to this work, understanding that it doesn't happen quickly, because you gotta have a software system, uh, and it doesn't happen without real intentional effort. And so we are uh, starting, uh, we are not where we want to be, but in a year we'll be much further, and in five years we'll be even further, and by the end of the decade, you guys will look at us and be like, okay, that's what it's supposed to look like. Uh, because we are committed for the long haul of ensuring that when Wichita State rises, Chakra Neighborhood rises, the state of Wichita or the city of Wichita and Central County and all that around us, 
or surround us rather, prophets and, and pastors as well. And so again, thank you to Christina for being willing to host her event on our campus today or your campus today. Thank you for being here. Uh, and we are really excited to be able to join those of you that have been in this line of work for a while in this effort.